Welcome to our seminar, Buy Homes by Mason, about how to buy and sell at the same time during COVID-19. And we have a special guest with us today, James Gadiosi of Atlantic Coast Mortgage. Say hi. Hi, how's everyone doing? So hopefully he popped up on the screen there. I'm not 100% sure how the Zoom recording works, but I hope that he popped up and he'll be talking to you here shortly. So a little bit about who I am first. I am Kristen Mason Correas, owner of the Homes by Mason team out of Keller Williams, KW United. And I am a top producing realtor in our area, in my office. I am consistently at the top of my office. I am a best of Zillow agent and have many other accolades there that you can see on the screen. That is not the stuff that I love to talk about. I just frankly love helping people. And that's one of the reasons why I am a top producing agent because I just do this because I enjoy helping people achieve the American dream, frankly, which is to buy a home. So let's talk about how you can do that, buy a home and sell a home at the same time is today's topic. So the concerns that most people have, right, are about, do I have the down payment? A lot of people have down the down payment in their current house and don't, or that's where they think that it is. A lot of times people don't realize there are other places where you can pull some money and it doesn't have to be out of stocks and investments. So James is going to talk more about that shortly and having two mortgages, right? So if you do buy a home before you sell your home, you're like, oh my God, how do I do that? If I have to carry two mortgages again, he'll talk about that being homeless. Nobody wants to be homeless we are going to make sure that doesn't happen. So uh, realtors are going to stay in business because we do this regularly. We help people buy and sell at the same time. And it, it, it can be a hassle. I call it a tango, right? So there are a number of logistics to manage and we will, the right realtor will help you through that. And of course, finding the right home. Some oftentimes people are like, well, I think it's gonna be easy to sell my home, but finding the right home. So we're gonna address all of these concerns today. So there's a couple of ways to go about this. You can list first or buy first. And even within those options, there's a few ways to go about it. So when you list your home first, you can buy contingent upon selling. And I have buy in quotations because you're not really buying a home until you close on the home, right? So when you buy contingent upon selling, what you're actually doing is you're writing a contract for another home that is contingent upon selling your home. There's another contingency. People don't often realize there's a difference. You can buy contingent upon closing your home. Two different contingencies. Contingent upon selling means you want to sell your home. You intend to sell your home. You may or may not have put your home on the market but it's just out there for people to buy it. And so that's contingent upon selling. Contingent upon closing actually means you have put it on the market and you are under contract with someone who has already agreed to buy your home and you're just waiting for it to close. You can see there's a very, very big difference between those two different contingencies and that contingent upon closing is way better than contingent upon selling. Then you can go non-contingent. So obviously, being non-contingent is better than being contingent, especially in a competitive market like we have in Northern Virginia. So in this case, if you need the funds from your home to buy the next home, then the way to be non-contingent in this case is to list your home, sell it, close on it, get the money in the bank and do a rent back and then buy your next home. So people think, oh my God, can that really happen? Yes, it happens all of the time. We are able to do that. Um, so, and the time frame for that, oftentimes it can happen very quickly, but in terms of the maximum amount of time there is that from when we put your house on the market until closing is gonna be roughly, uh, well, again, <laughs> roughly 30 to 45 days from when you get a contract to closing. And then a rent back period can be up to 60 days. So you can then get about 90 days or more from listing your home to getting into the next home, which is a pretty comfortable amount of time for most people, lots of people do it. So the next option is to buy first 
and then list your home. So within that, there's two ways to do that as well. So you can get your home under contract, then put it on the market and attempt coinciding closings. This can be a hassle because living in your home while it's on the market can be a hassle, right? People are coming through your home, especially now during COVID, there's a higher risk with people coming through your home. And our goal when listing your home is for it to look like no one lives there. We don't want dirty dishes in the sink. We don't want shampoo in the shower. We don't want toothbrushes out. Um, and it needs to stay clean and neat and tidy. So it can very much be a hassle. The advantage of doing this is for those people who are really nervous about carrying two mortgages, it can minimize that time. However, we're going to talk more about how that works. And so really, if you can purchase a home, move out of your home into the next one and then list your home, it can be the most hassle-free way to go about doing it. And while it makes a lot of people nervous and uncomfortable at first, Again, once you understand the finances of it, it you can get more comfortable with it. And um, again, working with a good realtor who can make all of this happen in a timely manner, we do this all the time. So for your information, a lot of people forget, you may, you, you would have experienced this when you purchased your current home, but your mortgage payment, your first mortgage payment on the new home is always gonna be on the second month after closing. So if today is December 13th, if I bought a home today, my first mortgage payment on my new home is not in January, but it's going to be on February 1st will be my first mortgage payment. So you get a month off, so to speak. So that can cushion people financially. And again, make that time frame a little more comfortable where you don't have a lot of months that you have to pay two mortgages. So now I'm going to hand it over to James to talk about the finances of buying first. So if you can buy first, right? What do you need to know to figure out whether you can buy first? Hey everyone, it's James Gattiosi. I'm with Atlantic Coast Mortgage. I, uh, like Kristen, love what I do. I love helping people get into their homes and their dream homes. I've been doing this about 19 years or going on 19 years. And uh, this year it looks like we'll service almost 300 people. So it's, um, been a really good uh, business and a lot of people we've, we've really enjoyed helping. Um, so going on, uh, the, the key questions we ask is if we're going to try to um, buy before we sell, what does it actually take to qualify carrying both mortgages? Um, and if you do qualify, where will the down payment come from? So those are the two main questions we're going to ask to see if this is something that we can make work. So, um, when it comes to down payment options, I'd just like to go over because people always ask me, well, where, where can I get the money for the down payment? So um, these are viable options that you could use if you had the down payment so that you could actually, you didn't need to pull the money directly from the house or didn't need to sell your house. The money could come from obviously any checking, savings or investment accounts. Um, a little known um, option is a 401k loan. Normally you can borrow money from your 401k and we can use those funds as a down payment. Um, and then when you do sell your home, you could always pay your 401k loan back. And another added benefit is if there's a loan payment, let's say you borrowed 50,000 on your 401k and you had say a $300 a month payment, we don't even need to include that payment against you as far as getting qualified. So um, another great option for down payment is a gift, a gift from a family member. When gift simply means there's no um, payment or a payback required. Um, and then a home or a HELOC or a home equity line of credit. So a lot of times if people are thinking about purchasing over the next couple of years or next couple of months, a good option would be to get a home equity line of credit on your home. And what that simply is, is a, a new loan that enables you to tap into the equity um, so that you could actually use that equity to purchase a new home before you sold your home. Um, but that's something you want to make sure you have done way ahead of time, because if you're thinking about listing your home and getting a home equity loan simultaneously, it's most likely not going to work out for you. So that's something you want to prep for. If you're looking six months or 12 months down the, um, down the line, go ahead and apply and get that home equity line now. Also with um, just 
with COVID and uh, the increased timeline to get the home equity loans, sometimes you used to be able to get them in 30 days. Oftentimes it's taking 60 or even 90 days before you can get one. So jumping on that um, uh, as early as possible is a great option. So uh, another uh, option for down payment that comes up a lot of times is selling personal property. In fact, I had somebody who sold a boat recently um, and that would be acceptable. Uh, that would be acceptable um, form of down payment. You just need to make sure that you can certainly paper trail everything. Usually boat's not an issue, but if, for example, if you sold a grand piano, you need a bill of sale. You need to be able to show that you got a check from the person that, you know, that bought the piano and some type of agreement that, you know, you were selling it because um, if you don't have that paper trail where you can show where um, those funds came from, it won't be considered uh, acceptable form of down payment. So that being said, I like to go over the non-acceptable forms of down payment, which would be um, a lot of times people will take an unsecured loan, like a, um, they'll just get a credit line with their bank that's not attached to something. That's different than if you got a home equity loan because that is a secured line of credit. Those, there's actually a lien placed behind your um, home. So that's secured line, that would be acceptable. But if you just got um, an unsecured loan, uh, and got those funds showing up, the underwriter wouldn't count those funds as acceptable form of down payment. Another thing we see a lot of times, which is also in a way unsecured loan would be if you took a credit card cash advance. So if you took a credit card and pulled $10,000 out on your credit card and you expect to use that for a down payment, um, that's generally not acceptable as a form of down payment. So um, a lot of times people say, well, my mom and dad are gonna let me borrow money or uh, yeah, my brother's gonna let me borrow these funds. Well, unfortunately you can't borrow any funds. So borrow loans are not acceptable, but you can receive a gift from a family member. So if your brother is willing to gift you and fill out a gift paperwork, then you could go ahead and use those funds for down payment. And another one that comes up all the time is cash. So I know there's a lot of real diligent savers out there and they like to put their money in their safe or underneath their bed. Unfortunately, the underwriters do not consider that money as acceptable form of down payment. Um, and then finally, any type of, like we discussed earlier, if you were to sell that piano, sell that boat trailer, uh, and you weren't able to actually paper trail it and show that the actual sale, they wouldn't be able to use any of those funds. So getting the down payment, um, these are some, these are the options that you could have for getting funds in order to put that down payment. And if you can meet the down payment requirements, the next step um, would then be obviously seeing if you could qualify carrying both the mortgages. So, hey James, I have a quick question. Yeah. In regards to the cash thing, so just to clarify, so you're saying basically cash that has been in the mattress or cash that's been Correct. in the deposit box, yeah, cash anything. that you've had that you that is legitimately your money, but if it's not been in a bank, right? As long right. as your cash needs to and, have been and here's in a, a bank. Good, Here's a, good, here's a good way, if you do have that kind of cash, if you were to go ahead and put it in your bank account and then wait 60 days or two months bank statements, at that point, those funds would be considered seasoned and then you could use that cash, but it's gotta get from underneath the bed or in your safe into a bank and sit there for a couple months so they can meet seasoning requirements and then you could go ahead and use those funds as a down payment. So get it out from underneath the mattress and into a bank as soon as possible. Okay, great. And then we're gonna talk about HELOC strategies real quick first. Yeah, 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 that'd be great. So one of the, um, a great strategy is using a home equity loan. So um, when you're purchasing a home in the current environment, we need basically a 5% down payment all the way up to an 822, 375 loan amount. So in, in this scenario, um, what we would do is, let's say you had a current home value of approximately $600,000 um, and you had a balance due of 400,000, but you also had a home equity line available up to 200. So you could uh, purchase the new home at $800,000. You could use the HELOC from your old home and use that $200,000 of down payment and then end up um, with a new loan at, um, Oh, that includes closing costs, a new one of approximately $620,000. Um, so you can get, as long as you can carry both those mortgages, you have the home equity loan already set up, ready to go, and use the home equity loan as a down payment to purchase the new home. So that would be um, 
one strategy of using that home equity loan to purchase a home while you haven't sold your other home. So another option would be um, same type of scenario, 5% up to the 822, 375. So you don't have a home equity loan on your current home. You're purchasing a new home that's $800,000. So you're gonna do a first loan of 640, and then you're gonna get a home equity line on the new home for $120,000. You're going to get your down payment of um, 30,000 off your 401k and your remaining down payment from a gift and savings of $30,000. So here's the case where you can use the home equity loan on a new house, subordinate financing or second mortgage, and you're able to purchase with a very minimal down payment. And then when you do sell your house, you can just pay off your home equity loan. You're just left with the one, one mortgage. So that would be another strategy where you can use a home equity loan on the house you're purchasing as opposed to the house that you're selling. So um, the big thing is that people ask is, well, how can I qualify carrying both the mortgages? So you must be able to carry both payments financially. And what does that really mean? It means you must have an acceptable debt to income ratio. So your debt to income ratio is simply your monthly expenses divided into your monthly income. So for example, if your monthly expenses, including say your car payment and your current mortgage and the new mortgage was $4,000 per month and your income was $10,000 per month, you'd be at a 40% debt to income ratio. And most likely you'd be in great shape to be able to purchase both homes simultaneously. So generally loans can exceed about a 45% debt to income ratio. And if it's a jumbo loan, meaning you're borrowing outside of the 822,000 um, cap, uh, generally they don't allow above a 43% debt to income ratio. So moving on to uh, the next slide. That is actually yeah. your last slide. I'm sorry? <laughs> that's actually your last slide. Oh, that was the last one. I'm sorry. Okay, I thought there was another one. So that's, that's how um, it really comes down to debt to income ratio. Can you qualify? Uh, how much do you make? How much do you have in um, expenditures for uh, be any type of um, minimum payment credit card, student loan, current housing expense, and the new housing expense? And as long as you can keep that debt income ratio under 45%, you can purchase both homes simultaneously without having to obviously have sold the other home. And the good news is you don't have to figure that out alone. Yes. So that's why we I have can do the math. <laughs> so that's why we have lenders to help you figure that out. So oftentimes when, when people are trying to figure out these things, I refer them to James to figure this out, whether you can qualify or not. And then, you know, you may qualify to do it and you may still not want to buy first, you know, the choice is going to be yours, but you want to find out if it's an option or not. So um, well, and, Ab and Chris, and just, just to continue on that, with the interest rates as low as they are in the 2% for 30-year fixed, there's, this is, and, and the market as hot as it's been, it's actually probably the least amount of risk um, in that case because the cost, of the, new, the cost of the new loan, the payments are so yep. low with the interest rates so low. Yes. And so I do have some slides on that. That's probably what you were thinking about. So let me, so when is the right time to buy? And so as James is pointing out, now may be the right time to buy because of those interest rates. So um, there's a couple of things that I'll talk about here, which is it's kind of hard to win on both sides of the coin when you're buying and selling at the same time. If you're selling your home at the peak in the market, then you're also buying a home at the peak in the market, right? So if you're, if you're getting the highest price for your home, then you're paying the highest price for a home. So that's why it's a little bit hard to win on both sides of the coin. Uh, if I can, ideally when I'm working with clients, I would like to um, be on an, like buy um, when prices are lower. So what this graph is, sorry to explain to you, this is a graph of a two year cycle of how the market in Northern Virginia trends. So the way that the market trends is that the highest prices do tend to be in the spring. Now these are closed sales. So if they closed in June, they went under contract in April or May. 
So that is when people are paying the highest price. And then prices tend to go down towards the end of the year. We often get this little blip at the end of the year, which I think is related to oftentimes there's a decrease in interest rates. And then they bottom out in December. You know, the things that close in January are typically at the lowest price and then prices pick back up. So when I'm working with people who are buying and selling, again, if we can buy when the prices are lower, and then sell as the prices are increasing, that's hopefully a win when you're buying and selling at the same time. So some questions to ask yourself when you're deciding if you wanna buy first or sell first, will it be harder to find the home that you're looking for or is it gonna be harder to sell your home? In our market in Northern Virginia right now, it's actually probably harder to find the home because inventory is so scarce. Um, most homes can sell pretty quickly because there's just not a lot of, there's a lot of demand because of low interest rate and there's not a lot of inventory. So um, we can generally sell homes very quickly. We can't always find your home because of low inventory. So uh, that may often be the case these days in the market. And what matters most to you? Making more money on the sale of your home or saving more money on the purchase over the course of the loan, which is typically gonna be 30 years. And so that's where the interest rates come in. And James, feel free to jump in on this if you want to. So the impact of interest rates, show, this graph shows you that a 1% change in interest rates can impact your purchasing power by up to almost 11%. And that's because as homeowners, you understand that your monthly payment is made up of both interest and principal. And so the more interest you pay, well, the lower that that principal payment is going to be, which means you afford less home. You're paying more interest so you get, you know, a smaller loan, essentially, right? You can't afford as much of a home. So I have a couple of slides that show this as well. The next slide shows you that this is for a $500,000 mortgage, these are, depending upon the week, the different payments for that same mortgage. They can be hundreds of dollars apart depending upon what the interest rate is. So in this scenario, it could possibly be as low as 2,300 or as high as almost 2,600, right? There can be a $300 difference because of what the interest rates are. And so this last slide, I really like to walk through with people because from scenario one to two, sometimes people say, well, what if prices go down? I wanna wait because prices are gonna go down. And that may be true during COVID, we have not seen the full financial impact of COVID, right? So I do expect that we will see more inventory on the market because there probably will be more people who do have to sell their home, unfortunately, due to financial stress. And so while I do expect some of that, frankly, I don't think that prices are probably going to drop because, again, supply has been so low and demand has been so high. I think an increase in supply will only be good for the market and may only stabilize prices. Um, I don't think it'll see a drop in prices. But if it were to happen, look at this graph. So from scenario one to two, what happened was the price of a home went down from 500000 to 475000 and the interest rate changed 1% it went up by 1%. In the gray line here, it shows you what the monthly payment is. So even though you thought you were getting that house for less, in fact, your monthly payment was $154 more each month. And over the course of the loan, $55,000 more you paid for that home that you thought you were getting for less. And what happens in scenario three is if prices go up and interest rates go up, well, guess what? your monthly payment, in this case, was $400 more a month. And over the course of a 30-year loan, almost $150,000 more. And that is oftentimes what we see in our market is both those things going up. James, everyone always wants to know what's going to happen with interest rates. What do you think? I think they're going to stay relatively low um, for the foreseeable future, but it's just so hard to tell if there's going to be you know, some fiscal changes with the new administration or 
it's just tough to tell what's really going to happen. I always tell people to look at things, what they are right now. And if the payments are affordable and with interest rates literally being the lowest in history, I'm with you 100% that there seems to be more of a risk in waiting um, than there would be than actually go ahead and buy something at 100, 100 year low interest rates. So I always tell people, you're probably never going to see interest rates as low as they are right now. Um, why not? You know, if you, if the payment's affordable, why not take advantage and lock in, uh, you know, a two point three seven five thirty year fixed rate right now for the you know for the next thirty years? We just can't beat that. Right. You don't know what the future holds. All we know is what mm -hmm. we know now, and so so that is a, a a reason to buy now while you, while interest rates are still low. Again, we just don't know what's going to happen. Even though we do anticipate they may stay low, we just don't know. So then how long does it take to sell? So if you do end up buying first and then having to sell, right? If you're nervous about having those two mortgages, how long is it gonna take you? So again, it depends on a few things. Uh, and one of those things is supply and demand as we talked about. So we look at this graph again, what the two year cycle is. Again, this is the older graph from 2018 to 2020. I'm gonna show you, oh no, actually, sorry. This is, this might be the current one. But this shows again those trends, okay? So the highest demand is in the spring. And then towards the end of the year, demand is lower. So generally, it things sell quicker when there's higher demand. And yet there are a few other factors as well that go into how long does it take to sell your home? Your realtor and the marketing that they do for you is one of the factors. And then also the pricing strategy that you have. Okay, so there's a few strategies that we consider when we're listing a home. There's either pricing it right, pricing it competitively, or pricing it aggressively. So a competitive price would be slightly lower than what we think the value of the home actually is. So when you do that, the goal is not to sell it for less. The goal is to sell it for more, frankly, right? If you put it on the sale rack, so to speak, right? Put a bargain price on it that tends to generate multiple offers. It gets lots of people coming through the home quickly and you will often will get multiple offers going above your asking price. And that often results in a fast sale. And then the right price should ideally do the same thing too. You're just never quite sure if you do get that price right. So sometimes it might be a better idea to be a little conservative and maybe go a little bit lower if you're not sure what the right price is in order to drive the most people through and ideally drive the most offers to, in order to sell it quickly. An aggressive price would be if you price it above what the true market value is. And so that could backfire for you because the first two weeks on the market are the most important. And if you're not getting the right buyers through the door in those first two weeks, your house then gets that scarlet letter. We all know, right? That a house that sits on the market, people think something's wrong with it. So if you don't sell quickly, then you might be chasing buyers after that. So I don't recommend an aggressive price when time matters, when you do want to sell it quickly. And so of course, the next question then is, what's the right price for your home? So again, it's hard to know that, but that's part of what professional realtors are still in business for is to help you get the price right. So you can go online and there's lots of sites out there that say, you know, I'll tell you what the price of your home is. I have one of them, right? So if you um, go to, I think it's novahomeprice.com. Yep, that's what it is. That's ours at Homes by Mason. That that site is out there. You can fill in your address and then you get two options. You can get an automated estimate of the value of your home or you can sign up for a no cost, no obligation consultation with me to come into your home, look through your home and then do an actual in-depth analysis of the comps after I've been inside your home to give you what my opinion is of the right price of your home. So that is the best way to get the right price of your home. Uh, all of those consumer sites, the Zillows and the Redfins, that they'll give you estimates, but that's purely based upon public information, which is obviously not full information. So if you're going to sell your home, right? So you're buying and selling, you just don't know when, but you know you're gonna sell your home at some point. How should you get started, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that. First, you want to decide what needs to be done. 
to the home. Oftentimes you're gonna to wanna to make some improvements in order to maximize the, the sale of the home. And so ideally you wanna consult with a trusted realtor. You don't have to make these decisions alone. Again, you're not a professional who sells homes. So you're gonna be guessing. As a professional who does this, I have a better idea of what people are looking for when they're buying a home. Once you know what needs to be done, once you have a plan in place, then you want to time your home improvements, right? Come up with a plan for when you'll do it. Uh, maybe there are some things that you can do now while you are still living in the home. And maybe if you are gonna move out, then you know doing floors and things like that, you would wanna do after you've moved out. Or even if you're still gonna be living in the home, something like carpet, you probably don't wanna do until right before you go on the market because you don't wanna risk you know, having a spill and staining that new carpet. So do it at the last minute. So timing your, your home improvements. So again, you can prepare for your sale by getting estimates and choosing contractors ahead of time, getting them lined up. Contractors these days during COVID, believe it or not, are actually very busy. So you want to get into a relationship with good contractors, get some estimates, know what you're going to do, let them know when you want to do it, um, have them on speed dial so that you are ready once the time is right to get them in and do the improvement that you want to do. Everybody needs to declutter and depersonalize, including me. <laughs> so when you're selling your home, that is gonna be the first um, assignment for everyone. And so you can do that at any time. Start to divest of things that you don't want or don't need. Start donating things. Start putting away the knickknacks and the mementos that you don't really need to have out, right? Pack those up, You know, take care of them, put them away in a box because you don't need those things out when you're selling your home. We want your home to be as decluttered and depersonalized as possible. So you can do that at any time. Get a box, get some packing paper and start doing that. It is never too soon. At Homes by Mason, we also do a seminar on preparing your home for a successful sale where we talk more about some of those things. So if you are interested in that seminar, please reach out and let us know and we can get you linked into that seminar. And so a quick at a glance, again, of making those decisions about what needs to be done as a professional realtor, these are the things that I'm gonna consider. I'm gonna consider, does your home look dated? Um, are the improvements that you've made maybe really personalized? If so, are there ways that we can depersonalize things? First impressions matter a lot. We're gonna look at what the first impressions are. Kitchens and baths are most important. That's what buyers care about most. And so you may sometimes want to spend some money to make some money. And I want to help you get your best bang for your buck. So again, as a realtor, when I'm consulting with people, oftentimes, I hear sellers say, oh my God, I need to redo my whole bathroom. No, we can get away with maybe doing some cosmetic facelift improvements where you don't have to spend so much money. So those are some of the uh, decisions and conversations that I have with people when I'm doing these consultations. Afford there are often affordable improvement options. And again, I encourage you not to make those decisions alone. This is what we do to help people have a successful sale. So, Again, being in relationship with a good realtor helps make this process so much easier and less stressful for you. So in choosing the right realtor, these are the things that I would encourage you to consider. Is it a realtor that you know and trust? Do you know someone or do you know someone who knows a good realtor, right? So ask around, um, consider us, of course, we'd love you to consider us and look at the realtor's experience. So how much experience do they have? Length and time in the business does not necessarily equal experience. A realtor could be in the business for 10 years, but only sold one or two or three houses each year versus at Homestead Mason, we sold 40 houses this year. So number of transactions is what you wanna look at there and market knowledge. So where do they sell homes? In Northern Virginia, there's different markets, right? The closer into the DC area, that close in market is a much more competitive market than the further out areas. So where does the realtor do business and do they have market knowledge in your specific area? And what are the realtor's results? What are their track record and what are their results? So those are some of the things that I would encourage you to look at and consider when you're considering who's the right realtor. We also do a seminar on that. So we have something where, and I'll tell you the first time I did this seminar, I didn't think I had that much to talk about. <laughs> And then when I got into it, I actually had 
a lot of um, talking points on this seminar as well. So let us know if you're interested in that seminar. What's happening right now in our market? in Northern Virginia. So the most recent statistics we have are for October of 2020. So when we say, you know, talking about COVID, what, how has COVID affected our market? This graph shows you uh, what has happened this year. And you can see that when COVID hit was in March, right? And so there was a dip in the market right there, right after COVID hit, uh, price went down and activity went down. And then sh it didn't last for long. It really only lasted for two months, maybe, maybe three months max. And then that market activity picked right back up. Okay, so we did have a later peak this year than we did most years, but look at how much higher price is than last year. Okay, and then since the peak, so we did peak and we are following that same trend where, okay, at the end of the year, things are slowing down a little bit and prices are coming down a little bit, but yet look at this activity. They're really, actually, it's been a really, really active market this year. And I'll tell you why, and this is probably not a surprise to you. People have looked around their homes in quarantine and said, this house is not big enough anymore. I need a home office. I don't have to commute to work anymore. I don't have to live as close to work as, as, as I thought that I did. I want more outdoor space for me and my family. So for all of those reasons, in addition to interest rates, people have decided to move. People want to move right now for all of those reasons. So we have had a very, very active real estate year in um, Northern Virginia. So you can see again, in terms of trends, we the price, uh, median price has come down a touch from last month and from last year, price is up almost 10%. And then this shows you inventory, time on market and average sold price to original list price. So in terms of inventory, we have low inventory in our area. We've had low inventory for a long time. So as I mentioned before, that is one of the stresses on our market for buyers in our areas. There's not enough homes to choose from. And that has just continued. So again, an increase in inventory would not be a bad thing for our market. DOM stands for days on market. So you can see, look how quickly things sold this year in October, average 16 days on market. That's crazy. It's half what the five-year average was, okay? And then average sold price to the original listing price or the asking price. In October, it was above 100%. So generally right now, and again, this largely relates to the low inventory. Homes are selling at or above asking price. And if you look at year to date, so the year to date, we are at 99.9% .9 is what homes are selling for in regards to their sold price to their asking price. So precautions due to the pandemic. We are still selling real estate. Obviously you saw that. Almost everything can be done virtually if you want it to be virtual. And frankly, buying a home these days is safer than buying groceries because you don't have to interact with that many people. You don't interface with as many people buying a home as you do when you go to the grocery store. So we also are requiring masks. Those are mandatory, of course, for any viewings. and. Um, there are, so if you're on the buying or selling side, right? So there are open houses still happening. We stopped them for a while, but we are doing them again because people are coming and people are doing it safely. Again, masks are required. We have touchless sign-in systems in most cases. Hand sanitizer and gloves are always made available by Homes by Mason and encouraged for people to use that. So uh, as a seller, you of course need to consider how comfortable you are with people coming through your home during this pandemic. Our goal at Homes by Mason always is to minimize the time on market. And we have a great track record of selling homes really after the first weekend. And so if we do that, 
we've always do that. And we still continue to do that now for our clients in order to minimize that time that people are coming through your home during a pandemic. However, of course, we encourage sellers to consider wiping down frequently touched surfaces after showings have occurred. So that is what's going on in the pandemic. And this is our next seminar we are actually doing next Sunday is on buying a home for the first time in Virginia. So that's all that we've got for today. Do you have anything else to add, James? He's unmuted. Sorry, I was looking for my unmute button. No, <laughs> no, I think you covered it pretty well. It's a great time to buy with the interest rates as low as they are. Many people can actually buy another home without selling their home, which I think gives you the best of both worlds and helps you net, like you said, helps you net top dollar for your place. If you can get out of there, get it cleaned up, make it like a, look like a model home. And it's just the, um, it's, it's a great time to take advantage of these record rates and uh, make your dream come true. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing this with me. I appreciate Pleasure. you being here. And if anyone wants more information about what we talked about today, feel free to reach out to Homes by Mason and we can put you in contact with James. And our contact information is was on the slide. I'm no longer sharing it, but we will make sure that you have it. Um, www.homesidemason.com is the easiest way to find us and our contact information. And thank you again for joining us. Bye.